Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Who. That was. Oh, you have the. Put there. It's got a laser. It's got a. Okay, how do we? How does this work? I've seen it followed by I think they find that supply chain. So we're going to have to. So if you want to. And the arrows move the slides. <laughs> okay. Okay, got it. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Moore. That was it's always very um, informative hearing you speak. So, um, my name is Libby Galmer. I'm a physiatrist, and actually, we trained at the same institution at uh, Columbia and Cornell in the city. Um, after that, I went to do a fellowship at Hospital for Special Surgery, half with the Department of Orthopedics in Metabolic Bone, and the other half with <coughs> Physiatry and Sports Medicine. And um, one of my big interests is in what's called regenerative orthopedics. So many people have, don't know what that means, but may have heard some of the buzzwords like platelet-rich plasma or stem cells. And so I'm going to give an overview of some of the most common treatments that fall under this. Not really going to be talking about the spine as much because that was covered, um, but mainly everything else. So all the other joints, tendons, ligaments can be treated with these um, so hopefully this is a good overview. You may have questions after. I'd be happy to answer them. So as Dr. Hu touched on, we're, we're basically in the midst of a chronic pain crisis. Uh, 100 million adults are affected by chronic pain in the US. And in 2010, the cost of pain associated with reduced worker productivity increased to over $635 billion. And the annual cost of treating pain is greater than the cost of treating heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. So just as an example, hip and knee arthritis, which we see a lot of, um, is a common source of chronic pain. And because of advances in medicine and longer lifespans, people are living longer. They are living longer with these chronic conditions and developing more of these chronic degenerative conditions. And we do about 600,000 hip knee replacements and about almost 300,000 hip replacements every year in the United States, and that number is growing. So, you know, it seems like once you start developing arthritis, it's an inevitable end is that you're going to end up with a joint replacement unless we can come up with some way of delaying or preventing the degeneration. And so that's related to arthritis. The same, you know, applies for tendon issues. So. <coughs> When we talk about treating uh, sports injuries, degenerative conditions, tendinopathies, the current sort of orthopedic musculoskeletal dogma is that you want to identify the problem, you control the pain and inflammation, and usually that's done by you know, the RICE protocol, rest, ice, compression, elevation, anti-inflammatory medications, uh, corticosteroid injections are pretty commonly used, traditional rehab, which we know has a lot of value, and eventually return to function and, you know, decrease pain. But there's a new emerging philosophy when we talk about non-surgical orthopedics especially, and that's we want to try to help your body help itself. So that's what I'm going to be talking about. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of question as to the benefit of corticosteroids for the treatment of these degenerative conditions such as knee arthritis and tendinitis and all these other things. Um, there's been some pretty good studies done looking at anti-inflammatories and corticosteroid medications for this. And they actually found that in many cases they have a negative effect on tendon to bone healing. Uh, in rotator cuff issues, they also looked at it for um, lateral epicondylitis, which is a fancy way of saying tennis elbow. And again, does well in the short term and then the pain tends to come back later with a vengeance. And people actually had a decline in function and an increase in pain. So I'm not going to get into a lot of research, but just some of the bigger studies that were done. So this is kind of what we call a sugar high effect. You get a steroid injection, you feel great for a period of time, and then you crash and you come back with more pain later on. So this is a kind of a relatively new field, although you'll see it's actually been around for many, many years. But it's gained a lot more traction in medicine and in the media in the last 20 to 30 years. So there's a lot of different types of regenerative treatments available. Prolotherapy, dry needling, PRP, injecting whole blood, um, stem cells, <coughs> adipose stem cells. So you may have heard these terms floating around. Um, 
So what is regenerative injection therapy? It's basically a form of treatment for chronic pain. Uh, we're trying to induce uh, a low level of inflammation and trying to stimulate proliferation or regeneration of the damaged tissue by stimulating the release of different growth factors in the body. Uh, the goal is not to mask the pain or block the nerves, but rather to stimulate healing in the area. Uh, and combining that with you know, targeted physical therapy, strengthening so that we stabilize the underlying structures, we want to ultimately achieve our goal of restoring function without pain, without chronic medication use. Uh, so, as I mentioned before, there's lots of different types. I'm going to talk about the three most common ones that are used, the three that I use the most in my practice. And that's prolotherapy, which is kind of the original regenerative treatment, uh, platelet-rich plasma, and bone marrow stem cell therapy. So, the injury response cascade, when we suffer an injury, there's basically different phases of how our body tries to heal that. Uh, there's the acute injury, so we have the acute inflammation that happens. Then there's the regenerative phase where we're delivering the cells that try to heal that damaged tissue. And then at some point the body says, okay, enough is enough, and they start to develop scar tissue, and that's the fibrosis phase, and that's where you can develop you know, scarring and things like that. So basically with regenerative medicine, our aim is to enhance the regenerative phase of the healing and minimize or eliminate the scar formation phase. And we're trying to basically build normal tissue. So not scar tissue, but we're really just trying to prolong the regenerative process to really build more normal tissue. And we do this by introducing various growth factors that stimulate healing. So this is, if you remember what the last one looked like, this is a little bit different. So that the inflammation phase is actually about the same. The regenerative triangle is a little bit bigger, and then the scar phase is actually reduced. So I like to think of it as kind of a spectrum. Um, prolotherapy is sort of the, the basic, most uh, simple and in some ways more elegant treatment. Uh, it's basically injecting a uh, sugar solution, which stimulates the release of growth factors. Uh, after that is platelet-rich plasma, where we actually take your blood and deliver the platelets, the concentrated platelets, directly to the site of injury. So you're kind of skipping the step of stimulating the growth factors, you're releasing them directly into the site of injury. And then the next step is um, stem cell injections where instead of relying on the platelet growth factors to recruit those stem cells, we're really harvesting them and injecting those directly in. So, so the PRP using the patient's own blood? Yes. We, take your, we draw your blood just like in the doctor's office, we spin it down in the office and then we inject the concentrated solution in. So, you know, with each of these, they become a little bit more involved, a little bit more invasive, and more expensive. So, there's a lot of conditions that can be treated with this. This is just touching on a few, really. Um, different types of arthritis, such as knee arthritis, hip arthritis, shoulder, um, tennis elbow, golfer's elbow, which is medial and lateral epicondylitis, rotator cuff issues, partial rotator cuff tears can be treated with this. Uh, different, all different types of tendinopathies, certain types of back pain, um, plantar fasciitis, sacroiliac joint pain, and so on. So prolotherapy, which is, gets its name uh, from the term proliferative therapy, is a regenerative injection therapy, which basically means you inject any substance that promotes the release of growth factors. So technically, PRP and BMAC are, are a type of prolotherapy. Um, it's a non-surgical treatment that stimulates healing in the area, and it typically in involves injecting a mild irritant. So there's different things that have been used over the years, and like I said, the, the most commonly used and the most commonly researched is dextrose, and there's many reasons for that. Um, and, and basically, we're trying to stimulate the body's natural healing response. So a little bit of history of prolotherapy. Interestingly, Hippocrates, the father of medicine who lived 460 to 370 BC, actually spoke about something called sclerotherapy, which was kind of the father of prolotherapy, where uh, for chronically dislocating shoulders, he actually described sticking a hot poker to cause some scar tissue and try to stabilize that down and causing that inflammation to heal that shoulder. So, I mean, the idea of irritating an area to get it to heal goes way, way back. Um, and then in the 1930s, it actually was mentioned in the dental literature to try to stimulate uh, 
healing of TMJ, temporomandibular joint issues. And then George Hackett, who was considered the father of prolotherapy, was an orthopedic surgeon in the 50s. And um, he was actually a trauma surgeon, and he noticed that after people would come to him after an accident and he would fix their broken bones, they would have all of these kind of pain syndromes left over. And uh, he hypothesized that this was really because the ligaments had been overstretched or maybe this was a problem with the connective tissues or the soft tissues. And so he started looking into that and he actually uh, started injecting different irritants into the area and got really good results and um, eventually teamed up with another doctor, Dr. Hackett. And uh, they sort of kind of exploded this term. They also started using dextrose as opposed to some of the other things which has a much better safety profile because it's basically just sugar water and there's really not much harm that you can do from a short-term exposure to sugar, even if you're diabetic. Uh, so <coughs> even uh, former Surgeon General C. Everett Koop was treated by Dr. Hemwall for intractable back pain. And he was quoted saying, I have been a patient who has benefited from prolotherapy and having been so remarkably relieved of my chronic disabling back pain, I began to use it on some of my patients. So it has been around for a while. Uh, the rationale for how prolotherapy is used, and, and one of the things I find that it's the most useful for is actually ligament issues. And that's because um, chronic musculoskeletal pain can sometimes be due to inadequate repair. So, you know, our body tries to do its best to fix an issue. Sometimes it does it incompletely. Uh, sometimes it's because the ligaments or certain areas of the body don't have a very good or robust blood supply. And um, basically, that leads to ligament or tendon laxity, and that sends signals to the brain saying that there's instability in that joint and stimulates kind of that pain fiber reaction. Um, and basically, as long as the tissue is not functioning properly, those pain receptors are going to continue to fire and lead to more pain and more limited function and so on. So what we're doing is we're injecting the solution in, we're stimulating a low level of inflammation. We're kind of trying to trick the body into thinking that it's a new injury. So it does all that initial um, healing stuff that it does. It sends all those growth factors and all those cells and attracts stem cells into the area. Um, fibroblasts, growth factors, and stimulates collagen, which is what most of our tissues are made out of. Uh, there's also, a, there's a lot of research, and in all the regenerative medicine, I'll say that there needs to be a lot more research, and mainly it's because only now are people trying to start to standardize even the terminology that's used to describe what they do. So a lot of the research, you know, they combined it with other therapies, they combined it with physical therapy, they weren't specific about the concentrations or the dosing. So even though there's a lot of published research, it's not all very good quality. But there is some level one evidence, which is the best quality evidence that we have in research in prolotherapy, looking at knee arthritis, um, hand arthritis, and tennis elbow. Um, and these are just... Just for time's sake, I'm not going to read off the details, but you can certainly read them later, just talking about some of the, the results that they had looking at some of these research studies. So, although further research is needed, there's actually enough research on prolotherapy that it's, by definition, not considered an experimental treatment. Um, it's taught as an acceptable method at approved postgraduate programs. There are sufficient publications to support its safety and accuracy, and there's level two or higher um, evidence in multiple areas. So this is something that we should be discussing more because by definition it's no longer an experimental treatment. There is value to this. And so for my conclusions on prolotherapy before I move on, um, it's most promising in tendinopathies and ligament issues. So the research shows that it works really well for tennis elbow, Achilles tendinitis. There's some pretty decent evidence that it works for sacroiliac joint issues um, as well as certain types of arthritis. Mostly they the best research has looked at knee arthritis and then small joint arthritis, such as finger and hand. Um, it's safe. There's very few risks associated with it. And like anything else, more research is needed. So the next, the next sort of bump up is platelet-rich plasma. Um, this has been around since the 70s. This is, was originally used in veterinary medicine. Um, I heard a doctor once say, you know, if you want to know what they're going to be doing in humans in 30 years, look at what they're doing to horses now. So, I mean, that's, it's basically true. <laughs> so, this was being done in veterinary medicine, and then, um, actually, 
an NFL football player's horse was treated with this, and he saw how well the horse did, and he asked the doctor to try it on him. And that's kind of how it transitioned into being used in humans initially. And that doctor ended up to, to be one of the most prominent researchers in, um, in the field of regenerative medicine. And um, it's also been used in dental medicine for a long time. And in 2009, the New York Times published an article talking about PRP, and that sort of started to raise public awareness. And it's been used by countless numbers of athletes for all of their injuries because, you know, they don't want to keep injecting cortisone for their little injuries, and this actually tries to stimulate healing. So that also gives it a, a little bit of uh, popularity as well. So like prolotherapy, the purpose of PRP is to stimulate uh, tissue healing by stimulating the body's natural healing response. So this is concentrated platelets. And what is a platelet? It's the cells that your body sends to an area. So when you cut yourself, the platelets are the cells that come that form a clot. And those cells come with all of the materials needed to basically heal that injury. So that's sort of the rationale behind concentrating the platelets and injecting them in is their whole purpose is to promote healing. Um, PRP, by definition, is concentrated platelets, so it has to be concentrated at least three to five times baseline, a uh, minimum of a million platelets per microliter and five mLs of plasma is what you need. And now there's systems that can concentrate them higher, and there's a lot of back and forth about what's best. Um, they can be used to treat tendinopathies, ligament injuries, and degenerative conditions such as arthritis. Uh, so, as I mentioned already, they're best known to help clot blood, but also contain hundreds of proteins that are involved in healing. Um, chemo, they, they promote chemotaxis of undifferentiated cells to the site of injury. So that basically means that they attract cells that can become other cells to the site of injury. And um, they also promote cellular differentiation, so, you know, they get those cells to become the type of tissue that is injured. Uh, and among other things. So uh, tennis elbow, for some reason, loves these regenerative injections. All the research on tennis elbow, it's just always it always works. Um, and and there's a lot of there's a lot of good research on this. So um, PRP versus steroids. You know, tennis elbow. Even if you ask our hand surgeon that works with us, he'll tell you steroids for tennis elbow are not a good idea, and you're better off getting something like PRP because it's not really an inflammatory condition. It's sort of a chronic degenerative thing that happens. And, um, you know, with the steroids, people do well. Pain comes back after a few months. And when they compare the two, uh, there was much better uh, pain relief and improvement looking long term, so at one and two years out with the PRP group. And then PRP versus whole blood, which basically means we just take your blood and then inject it right back into the site of injury. Um, they both did well, but there was a higher incidence of conversion to surgery in the whole blood group. And then PRP versus tenotomy. Tenotomy basically means we take a needle and we just poke around in the injured area and try to stimulate some microbleeding there. Um, and, and they both did well also, but the PRP group did a little bit better. And that's all level one evidence too. So, you know, there's, this stuff has been researched. And that's what it feels like when you have arthritis. Um, so, you know, in osteoarthritis, PRP has been shown in different studies to reduce inflammation, um, to reduce the effects of damaging cells on cartilage, uh, reduces synovial membrane hyperplasia, which is something we see in arthritis, and might improve kind of the, the overall joint homeostasis or the sort of environment of the joint itself, which is why sometimes people feel less pain within a week or two, even though nothing architecturally has changed at that point. Um, Sorry, and the platelets are taken from your own blood. Say again? Platelets are taken from your own blood. That's correct. Yes. Um, so in 2014, there was a review of 10 big studies. They all showed significant improvement in clinical scores at six months post PRP compared to pre intervention scores. And PRP compared to hyaluronic acid injections, which is your Simvisc, your Orthovisc, the gel, which I actually love. Um, but the PRP did do better in some of these studies. And um, overall, poor outcomes, as you can imagine, are associated with you know, increased age, worse severity of disease, and actually patellofemoral disease in the knee didn't do as well. So that means arthritis, where the arthritis is behind the kneecap and not between the two long bones of the leg. So last but not least, um, stem cells. 
So stem cells is, you know, is a big buzzword, and I think it's great. Um, but I did think the other two deserved a lot of time because you don't always need to jump to stem cells. A lot of times, something like prolotherapy or PRP is enough. But there are cases where this can be really helpful. So just because there's a lot of confusion out there about stem cells, there's two types of stem cells. There's embryonic stem cells, and there's adult stem cells. So embryonic stem cells are found in embryos. They can become anything. Um, they're what make all your cells when, when you're developing in, in the womb. And that's where all of the ethical and the legal issues really are. When people talk about, you know, should it be, is it ethical to use stem cells or not, they're talking about embryonic um, or embryo-derived stem cells. So adult stem cells are actually cells that we get from our own body, because our body is constantly breaking down and constantly rebuilding. Um, we have stem cells in our blood. And so when we talk about adult stem cells and what I'm referring to, we actually harvest cells from your body and we concentrate those stem cells and then we inject those back in. And they're multipotent, so they can't become anything, but they can become a lot of things. And they can migrate to the site of injury. So a nice thing, unlike PRP and prolotherapy, you have to really be specific about where you're injecting. With stem cells, they, they have a homing mechanism. They can actually kind of smell out the area of injury and they can get there. So these um, mesenchymal stem cells, which are the ones that we get out of the bone marrow, they can become bone, cartilage, muscle, bone marrow, uh, tendons, ligaments, fat tissue, and connective tissue. So for my purposes, that's the perfect cell. Um, they, the function of them in tissue repair depends on a lot of things, and there's a I mean, every three months there's a conference and they're changing the recommendations and they're changing what they're calling these cells because uh, there's a lot we still don't know about them. But basically, uh, you know, there's a lot of variability in terms of the way we isolate the cells, the way we concentrate them, and then that sort of determines how they respond um, to the treatment and how those cells develop into the, you know, what they're going to become as they're healing. Um, stem cells, obviously, when we're young, we have lots of them. And then as we get older, we have less of them. So that's something that we have to keep in mind also when I have patients coming and asking about stem cells. You have to take the age into consideration. And although you don't need a ton of them, you do need some. And so that is a factor. People that are younger tend to do better, but obviously people that suffer from arthritis tend to be older, and, and that's what we use it the most for. So there's sort of that um, perfect little window of opportunity. Um, and, of course, when you're talking about stem cells, people always want to know, is it safe? Is it going to turn into cancer? What if you have cancer? Um, and there's been a lot of research looking at the safety data of this as well. So, basically, uh, a big study done, or sort of a big study done, they, they looked at um, different, a lot of different people getting these bone marrow transplants, um, injections for, for arthritis conditions. They had no infections and no tumors. They followed them up to 137 months. They had improved pain and improved walking, and they actually found that some of the cartilage defects filled in. So that's another question we get is, does it actually fix the arthritis? And I always tell people, you know, it's not going to look the way it did when you were 20, but a lot of the research is showing that some cartilage does, does regrow. And then um, this other, uh, Peters in 2013, they looked at eight studies, so there's a total of 844 procedures looking at this procedure for arthritis. And the most common side effect was increased pain and swelling at the site of injury. Um, the ICSM does not recommend people getting this treatment if they have had an active malignancy within the past five years. So if you have a history of cancer more than five years old, it is safe to get this treatment. And then Regenex, which is one of the uh, biggest sort of companies that does stem cell treatments, they... Um, they have the biggest database, I think, of all the research. They keep track of all their cases, and they have hundreds of doctors that work for them. So they, this is now a couple of years old, but they had over 3,000 procedures. They looked at stem cells for knees, hips, ankles, hands, wrists, elbows, you name it. They followed them up to nine years out, and they followed them every few months and then every year. And um, I guess I left the slide with their conclusions out, but basically they um, main... The main negative effects were, you know, pain and swelling at the site of injury. Uh, they didn't have, I think they had um, like five cancers, but overall the incidence was less than in the general population, so we think it would have happened anyway. Um, and, and basically the safety data is pretty solid on this.
And there's a lot of research being done in this right now, about 18,000 studies in different areas of stem cells. If you go to clinicaltrials.gov and you look up stem cells or mesenchymal stem cells or MSCs, you'll see there's just thousands and thousands of clinical trials right now looking at different things. So um, how you do depends on lots of different factors. Your health at baseline is a, is a big component. Obviously, we're using your own cells to heal your own body, so how healthy your cells are and how healthy your body is plays a big role. So smoking is a big no-no. Um, if you have a lot of diseases, a lot of comorbidities, that's not good. Um, basically, if, even if you have a few well-controlled conditions, but you're on six different medications, you're worse off than you know if you have really high blood pressure, but it's well, you know, but you're only on a couple of medications. Um, and then obviously your post-treatment rehab protocol. So you know, equally important to doing the injection is making sure that you can support that healing down the road. And age, and as I just mentioned, comorbidities too. So things we still need to learn. Um, there are many variations of all of these procedures out there. And like I said, even just the nomenclature, the terminology that's used is only just starting to be defined. Um, what is the best place to get stem cells? Is it the bone marrow? Is it the fat? Is it placental tissue? Um, what is the frequency and the dose? And how many treatments do people need? These are all things that we're still teasing out. And do we combine treatments? Sometimes, you know, some people are combining PRP with hyaluronic acid or PRP with stem cells or, uh, you know, taking the plasma that's left over and injecting that. So, you know, there's a lot of different things being done. There's a lot of um, questions being still answered. And um, that, that concludes my overview of regenerative injections. So, have a seat, Kermit, when I'm about to tell you my cause of shock. Anyway, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs>